A couple months ago, Fusion Scale Graphics released a few runs of reflective striping. I got several sets of each of the yellow stripes, and I think they're worth going over. But this isn't going to be your usual Counting the Rivets review, though. Instead, this is going to be more like a mini video essay on reflective striping on railroad equipment. This video will be split into two parts. For those interested in information about conspicuity stripes in the real world, this video is for you. And for those who want a product review and how to apply these decals, that'll be part two of the series. Stay tuned. The railroad is a big industry, and like many industries that deal with heavy machinery and equipment, there are rules and regulations in place that make that industry safer. For the railroad, these rules include things such as drug screening for workers, marking of hazardous material with internationally recognized signage, and the wear of bright reflective vests for crews and maintenance workers. The regulation of interest today, also having to do with visibility, is 49 CFR subsection 224, or the Reflectorization of Rail Freight Rolling Stock. While there was no singular high-profile case that served as an impetus for this new regulation, there have been isolated incidents and accidents, particularly at night or under low visibility conditions, where a vehicle would run into the side of a train and would injure or kill the vehicle's occupants. That was Tammy Chamberlain. She lives just two homes down from the crossing where the crash happened. When she came outside Wednesday morning, this is what she saw. The vehicle's under the train, almost halfway. The driver of the vehicle just kept going and slammed into the train. Authorities say the flashing red signals had been activated. The driver of the car and the train engineers were not hurt. No word yet if the driver will face charges. The chief purpose of Section 224 was for, quote, enhancing the conspicuity of rail freight rolling stock so as to increase its detectability by motor vehicle operators and pedestrians at night and under conditions of poor visibility. In layman's terms, the industry needed a way to highlight the shape of a rail car so that it stood out to people driving and walking around active railroad tracks, especially in areas where big highway grade crossings are absent. This was done using retro-reflective technology. You may have seen this technology used on things like street and highway signage. The principle in this conspicuity striping is largely the same. To summarize, the tape is made from multiple layers of material combined to form a film that allows for light to be reflected back to the onlooker. As opposed to something like a mirror, where the light bounces off at an inverse angle relative to the source, prismatic film takes the light from the source and reflects it back to where it originated. The reflection is done using either embedded glass beads in the film, or a layer of microprismatic material, or material formed into an array of prisms that reflect light. You put that on top of an adhesive layer, and what you have is reflective tape. Back to the regulation, the tape is meant to highlight the general shape of the car or locomotive. So the tape is supposed to be applied along the length of the equipment in 4x18 or 4x36 inch long strips in a constant pattern, though there are some variations allowed on the exact patterns. Here are a few examples of different configurations of the tape on different types of freight cars. In this example of a boxcar, there are two configurations of seven stripes arranged in both a vertical and horizontal pattern along the car's roughly 60 foot length. The two stripes on the ends are the larger 4 inch by 36 inch strips, where the five in the middle are the shorter 4 inch by 18 inch strips. There is a slight exception to the requirement that the tape must have a constant pattern, and that is where there is a surface irregularity that may inhibit the stripe's ability to adhere to the surface of the car, or if placing the strip would obscure data printed on the car body. So anything like bolts, rivets, hinges, tie down brackets, and ladders, as well as road number and load limit information stenciled on the body. In this case, the rib design of the door of this boxcar would impede the stripe's typical placement, so it is instead placed a few inches higher out of necessity for the door to function properly and for the tape to be entirely visible. Here is an example of a 50-foot grain hopper. Much like the boxcar from earlier, there is also both a horizontal and vertical configuration that complies with the regulation. Another note is that the regulation does not specify an exact number of stripes to be placed throughout the middle of the car, just that there must be one at least every 12 feet as practicable. So depending on the car's length, there may be as few as three stripes in the middle, or as many as seven. 
The rule governing tank cars is a little different in that the stripes must be vertical. The pattern of the stripes must be centered along the horizontal center line of the car. Another allowable deviation is that the stripes may be placed a little lower so that the top of each strip is in line with the horizontal center line. Another note for tank cars specifically is that the tape cannot be placed anywhere on the car body that is underneath the fill point or manway so that any spillage doesn't compromise the reflection of the tape. Locomotives are also subject to this regulation. Like with freight cars, if strips are used, the strips must be between 4 by 18 inches or 4 by 36 inches long. But rather than needing to be spaced in 12 foot intervals, the strips must simply be placed as uniformly as the surface of the locomotive allows. Unlike freight cars, however, the regulation also allows for one long continuous strip along the length of the locomotive to be used instead of multiple strips. In addition to the scope and purpose of this regulation, as well as guidelines for application, there's also guidelines for periodic maintenance of these stripes. Like any other piece of equipment, this tape isn't merely a set and forget solution to the problem of equipment visibility. Dirt, mud, dust, grime, snow, and other environmental hazards and contaminants can shorten the lifespan of the tape, especially if poorly maintained. So section 224 also stipulates a guideline for periodic inspections as well as inspection criteria for the stripes. Stripes on freight cars must undergo a visual inspection anytime the rail car undergoes an air brake test, and if any of the stripes on the car are 80% present, undamaged, or unobscured, the deficiency must be written up and the tape will need to be replaced within 9 months of the notification of said deficiency. Locomotives have an identical criteria, except the visual inspection for the stripes takes place during the locomotive's annual inspection, and a record of the defect is kept either in the cab of the locomotive or in an electronic database that the FRA may request access to. Even if they survive the harsh environment, reflective stripes must also be replaced regardless of condition after 10 years of use. This regulation may not have been the silver bullet that stopped all vehicular accidents at railroad crossings, as the vast majority of incidents typically involve a driver attempting to be a train at a crossing and losing, but the argument can be made that any attempt to increase safety on the rails whether it's increased visibility or sturdier equipment, like with the double shelf coupler, is worth exploring if it can potentially save a life. With all that said, this wraps up part one of this two part series on retroreflective striping. As mentioned earlier, part two will be a product review for the new Fusion Scale Graphics Conspicuity Stripe sets, as well as a how to on using them. Stay tuned for that and much more coming your way soon. This is the first time I've done an essay type video on this channel. I've had a lot of fun with this project, and I might get around to doing more later on. If you would like to see more stuff like this going forward, feel free to provide any feedback in the comments below. With this being my first attempt at research content, I'm sure I may have missed some context, or got something wrong, or otherwise made a mistake or two here and there, so any feedback you have would be appreciated. Other than that, that's all I got for you today, and I'll see you in the next video.